Welcome to Junk Radio for September. Junk Radio is a pitcast from Nukipedia, the Fallout Wiki. Coming up in this broadcast, we have Lehman's Reign leading us through Fallout history, looking at the dawn of the Free States movement. This will be followed by the Mod Squad, where I talk to the team behind a project to put Fallout 1 into Fallout 4. LS will give the Cazadors the creature feature treatment. And lastly, in public occurrences, we get into some culture with the Wasteland Theatre Company. But first, the Nukipedia Network News. Good evening, I'm Agent C. News continues to come out regarding the Fallout TV series by Amazon Studios and Kilter Films. Charlie Besso, who appears to be a new actor to IMDb, plays a character called Tommy in the third episode, whilst Aaron Moten of Next and Disjointed plays a character called Maximus in the first. Although not listed in the cast, Michael Emerson does appear to have a stunt double performer listed as doubling for him. The series has previously had images released onto the internet showing a wrecked Super Duper Mart and Vault 32. Please keep watching the wiki for more details. There's also a link to the Fallout TV series page in our description. The Pit sees its release this week after its long spell on the public test server. A new crop of responders will take over the White Spring Resort where you can board a vertibird to the remains of Pittsburgh to help the Union. This update also sees the start of Season 10 with the City of Steel scoreboard. If you fancy an auto axe, you'll need to get started on pumping up your score. This should land as part of the customary weekly downtime. We do have some improved interactive maps hitting the wiki. We'll be tweeting these as they come available, so please check and follow our Twitter and check our previous tweets for those that have already landed. Xavier DJ has become an administrator on the wiki. The vote was 24-4, 3 no and 4 neutral. And lastly, and we hope this is the last time we have to cover this particular story, as you may recall, there was some drama back in May when bureaucrat Gay Darrow was banned by fandom for a year. Following an investigation that revealed unilateral and unauthorised changes to our policies, including content policies, other unreasonable administration actions, and issues regarding our social media accounts, the administrators of Nukipedia have decided to impose a lifetime ban on Kay Darrow. It was also revealed that although she claimed to have forgotten the credentials for our former YouTube account, someone has been accessing it to remove video and has changed the password recovery option since she left. No explanation has been offered for these actions despite numerous users attempting to reach her both directly and indirectly. We understand their plan to launch an independent competing wiki is continuing behind closed doors with the help of the unofficial Elder Scrolls pages. Unless something major happens, I expect this will be the last time we mention that particular former user or that project. Please stay with us though on Junk Radio for more Fallout Entertainment. Next is Layman's Reign with our new Fallout History feature. Looking for an exciting and long-running Fallout audio drama? Look no further than True Vault Escapades, a Fallout audio drama by Preston Harden. A hard-boiled detective and a girl from a vault solve some of the most notorious mysteries across the wastelands. If you love mysterious elements of the Fallout series, then True Vault Escapades is the Fallout audio drama for you. Available wherever you get your podcasts. It's the 16th of November, 2076, and the manager of Harper Supply sits down at his terminal to record a log on how business is booming. Sales at the shop have really picked up this month. A bunch of folks are buying up all sorts of camping gear, survival equipment, and canned goods. When I ask them what they're up to, they start talking about preparing for the end of civilization and the collapse of society. Sounds like crazy talk to me, but they're paying cash, so they can say whatever they like. Of course, it gets a bit scary when they buy cases of ammunition. I don't exactly feel comfortable knowing we've got these kooks living in the mountains sitting on that kind of firepower. Little did this humble shopkeeper know that within a year their entire world would be turned upside down, and those strange folks buying survival gear will have separated themselves from the country where they were born, and were perhaps best prepared to deal with the horrors to come. This is Fallout History, where we put you in the picture of some of Fallout's biggest events. This September, join the Free States movement during the countdown to the Great War. As 2076's winter turned to 2077's spring, tensions grew in Harper's Ferry between the townsfolk and their survivalist neighbors. On New Year's Day, police had to break up a fight between survivalists and patriots after complaints about government performance turned bloody, but this would not dissuade the survivalists. By May, survivalists could expect to be refused service at some local businesses, including the local medical clinic. 
As of May 23rd, this clinic no longer services the Carson family. This includes Caleb, Elizabeth and their children, Madeline and Max. You can refer them to Morgantown or to Charleston, but due to their constant involvement with the Free States, our doors are closed to them. This hostility was not limited to the inhabitants of Harper's Ferry. By March the 20th of 2077, federal agents described as wearing fancy suits were asking questions around Harper's Ferry, demanding names and addresses. By June, this had grown to military involvement in putting up warning signs, seizing property, and making arrests of members of the movement, including founding member Raleigh Clay, on dubious grounds, although another Free States member, Senator Blackwell, would secure his release. This would lead to even more drastic events. In September 2077, the Free States members finally declared their independence from the United States, and Senator Blackwell issued his final warning to the people of Appalachia. The only recourse left to the average American is to flee population centers and head into the wilderness, where one can find at least some hope of escaping the weird gaze of those in the government plotting against us. In response, Senator Blackwell would be branded a traitor, and the mayor of Harpers Ferry would demand the members of this movement leave her town. She would live to regret this, however, as after the Great War she returned, cap in hand to Raleigh Clay in his bunker, begging for help from the well-prepared movement for her town. There, in Harper's Ferry, the movement would unite with other survivors and consolidate its power, at least until the scorched threat became too great. Although the free states would not survive the scorched plague, their symbols of independence and freedom would continue to stand proud in Appalachia, all because of their decision to secede from the United States in September 2077. Looking for an exciting and long-running Fallout audio drama? Look no further than Chad, a Fallout 76 story by Kenneth Vig. Follow the adventures of optimistic anti-hero Simon as he goes on hijinks throughout the wasteland. If you want to experience more adventures from the Fallout series, then try out Chad, a Fallout 76 story, available wherever you get your podcasts. Coming up on the Mod Squad, we talk to the lead developers of Fallout Vault 13, a mod that hopes to be the remaster of Fallout 1 that many of you dream of. So joining me from the Fallout 13 dev team is Colin Wino and Giblib. How are you guys doing? Doing good. So can I ask you both, how did you both start with Fallout? Are you classic fans or did you start on the 3D games and move back to the classics? Sure. So my first Fallout game was Fallout New Vegas, and I fell in love with it pretty much instantly. Not too long after that, I got a physical copy of the Fallout Classic Collection, where if you don't know what that is, it's the CD that had Fallout 1, 2, and Tactics on it, and pretty much the rest is history. Uh, well, for me, I started with New Vegas 2 a little after it came out. Then I like slowly moved back to Fallout 3, and then to Fallout 1, and then 2. If there's some fall game to remake, to me, it always will be like Fallout 1. The amount of work required, there's not that much content in it. That's strange that you start with Fallout New New Vegas. Most newer fans either start with three or four and then sometimes have trouble with New Vegas. Ha- have you had any issues sort of with the other 3D fallouts or, or moving back to the classics? It's all pretty much the same thing. I know, you know, different studios will have different ideas of what they want the game to look like, but I found the classic Fallout titles to be really enjoyable. But again, it's just two different experiences. One of them is more of a classic top-down RPG game. The other one, especially in Fallout 4's case, it's like a looter shooter. They all have their respective strengths. You, you uh, did uh, hint at a bit of this there, Gibbler. What for you was the start of the idea to remake Fallout 1? Mm, we'll start with Colin. Uh, I'd been thinking about starting a Fallout 1 project. Around the time I was finishing up my most recent quest mod, James's Ruin, which came out in March of 2021, and one day by chance, I happened to stumble across a YouTube video that was made by Kreb, and Kreb would end up becoming our project's scripting lead. And in this video, he showed off the skill system from Fallout 1 working in Fallout 4. I reached out to him, and we agreed to start working together. And even now, we still use a modified version of the skill system that he showed off in that original video. We really have him to thank for a lot of the foundation that we have to work with. And for me, it was just like I saw that video, shot Kreb a DM, like, you need any help? I just joined as level designer and slowly worked my way up to co-lead. <laughs> That's amazing. How long have you both been working on this? So I started working on the project in February of 
2021. And I started working full-time primary project in March. I joined about like a month after it started, so yeah, March. Well, making Fallout 1 and 2 in the 3D engines is something that is often suggested on Reddit and other Fallout forums for Bethesda to do, with, with some posters suggesting that this might be something easy to do. How difficult did you expect it to be, and is it proving to be that difficult? People always underestimate the amount of work is, you're going to need. There's just a, always a lot more work than you actually think there is. Just like, how do you translate all the systems from the original game? One of the biggest ones would be like, how do you translate the large scale world into Fallout 4 without it being just like completely large and empty? It, at least with me, when it comes to this project, you know, at first, I didn't really know what to expect in terms of how difficult it was going to be. I've been making quest mods for Fallout games since 2013. And while quest mods, they take a bunch of work to make, but it does not come anywhere close to like the challenge and the workload of managing a project this big. But the good thing is, each and every single day, I learn something new, and I feel like I'm always constantly improving as a project lead. But to answer your question, it was a lot more difficult at first than I thought. But now that we're almost two years into the project, it's about as challenging as I thought it was going to be. Actually, is it two years? No, like a year, seven months. Oh, damn. We're closer to two years. I know a key part of Bethesda's design philosophy is that you should always be able to see something cool, be it a settlement, a checkpoint, or some other set piece. How do you go about filling in the map? So I have to explain first, like how we translate Fallout One's world into Fallout Four. Fallout One takes place over like half of Southern California, compared to Fallout New Vegas, it takes part in a tiny sliver of Nevada. The approach we're doing to make it feel huge, but also not being just completely empty. You could kind of think of like the Commonwealth and Nuka World; those are separate world spaces. So we have like five different world spaces, like small ones. Like all together, they overall like come to the size of the Commonwealth. Maybe a little bit bigger at this point. <laughs> yeah, 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 a little bit. <laughs> it helps that we're in the desert, isn't it? It's, it's not as dense as Boston. Yeah. That lets us do a lot of the like, more Bethesda-style stuff where there's a lot of stuff to explore. Like, just for example, in the world space with Shady Sands, Vault 13, 15, and Raiders. I've gone in there and added so many little random locations for you to explore that were never there in the original. Because that's something you have to actually add in if you're going to have all this empty space in between. you got to add dungeons, uh, interesting locations to explore. I know Colin has a plan for like a lot of collectibles that we're going to have in there. Oh, yeah. Whatever they do in Fallout 4, I try to mimic level design-wise. It's very ambitious for a fan project, what you're doing. Yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> but it's a labor <laughs> of love. You know, we've put so much time and effort into this. And, you know, this is this project is our baby. I can say one thing from like a level design point of view, like developing the first world space, like level design wise, oh, no. it's actually pretty close to being done. But I've <laughs> learned so much, like efficiency wise, like how to just do this faster and better. There's just a lot of uh, the, the way we did the first world space, or me, technically speaking, it was just very inefficient. So I think everything else will go much faster. Yeah, that's definitely true. Fallout has always aimed to have modal path to quests. For example, Tandy can be rescued with speech or with fighting or just snuck out the back. And one criticism of some of the newer Fallouts is sometimes it can be a bit more combat focused. How difficult has it been to make skills more meaningful in the game? Well, I'm personally a big fan of giving the player plenty of options when it comes to how they want to approach a situation. And, you know, with coming from my background playing and making mods for Fallout New Vegas, uh, when it came to Fallout 4, I really felt as though the players that wanted more stronger role-playing elements had really been, like, neglected. You know, I'm proud to say that for Fallout Vault 13, we're working really hard on making sure that the players that are looking for that type of role-playing experience with skill checks and having everything be meaningful, they're going to be pleasantly surprised with how we're handling things. For instance, this is one thing that we showed off in our J.D. Sands Showcase video, but in the caverns for Vault 13, before you can exit, there is a uh, locked fence gate, and you're going to have multiple ways of getting through. For example, if you have a high enough lockpicking skill at this point, like if you tagged it, then you'd be able to lockpick through the gate and have that serve as a tutorial of the lockpicking system. Or, if you don't have the lockpicking skill, you can search around the place and find a key hidden somewhere else. In other areas, there's going to be perception checks, like spotting a trapdoor that is completely hidden. For example, Vault 15. 
Yeah. Like in the original, just in Fallout 1, the only way to like traverse the different floors of the vault was to use a rope. That's still there. So like the default way would be to just use a rope. But say if you, once you enter the top floor, if you have high enough perception, you'll get a little pop-up saying you notice a loose panel on the floor and you open it. And that's like a little maintenance hatch that lets you go down the floor. Or you can just get a terminal and hack the door on the stairway so you can go down there. Yeah, definitely a lot of um, new options for fans of role-playing. But like at the same time, like keeping it uh, true to the original, though. That's part of the reason why I'm really excited to see what you guys are doing. Let's talk about the music. Now, you've shared three tracks on your YouTube channel, and for me, I think they fit so well that if you told me you had Mark Morgan tied up in a basement somewhere, I'd probably believe you. <laughs> Is there anything you can share about how they put together? You know, I can say that a lot of the composers we've worked with, they definitely share the same passion for the original titles that we do. And I think that, along with the fact that there's, you know, so much collaboration behind the scenes between the composers and the Fallout modding community, it means that these guys are able to experiment with sounds and plugins and collaborate and share what works with each other. Now, with voice casting, I'm presuming that you don't have Richard Dean Anderson and the other voice actors on staff. Have you found recasting to be a challenge at all? Oh, not at all. So the casting process has actually been pretty steady since we started looking for voice actors. There's an abundance of very talented voice actors in the Fallout community, so finding the right voice for some of the generic characters has been been a breeze but even for the special characters the unique ones that have their own voice actor you know again there's so much talent in the modding community it isn't really terribly difficult for us to find the perfect voice for these characters especially if you look at some of the characters we've casted already our Aradesh voice actor is just spot on it's actually surprisingly good yeah it's also helpful that like 95 percent of the characters in fall one aren't voiced they were just like text boxes so just as long as they sound good i was surprised at Aradesh too if if you didn't say in the video you're not using the original voice acting would have believed it probably was the original voice acting yeah yeah everybody's so <laughs> so good voice actors in the community lastly as an old fan i'm eager to get my hands on this and i'm not normally a big mod person now i know you don't have a release date but can i ask if i were to play today how far would i be able to get through the main quest well you probably crash on character creation because <laughs> i'm working on that right now if by some miracle you make it past character creation as far as the main quest goes you'd probably be able to make it i'd say about a quarter of the way through strictly the main quest main quest i think you would be really surprised by the amount of side content that we have already working in game yeah like a big thing we've been pushing for is like trying to get everything from fallout 1 done before we try and add anything extra yeah that's true we're trying to see if we can fill up the giant world that we have once it's finished we're going to see how all of the base game content works and if it still feels a little bit empty then we'll look into adding new stuff but you know, from what I've seen so far, I feel like the amount of side content with new locations that Giblib has added to the world is pretty dense so far. I guess like level design wise, it's actually pretty far. I'd say it's like, I guess it would be fair to say like a fifth stun level design wise. Yeah, and this isn't just a regular fifth. This is a, a fifth that was constructed sort of inefficiently and it's only going to be easier here on out. For example, like usually when you're creating a world space, you'd use like some height map to like map out your terrain like automatically for you. We did that kind of with the first world space we made, but we ended up just kind of doing it manually, mostly me just grinding away. So it's all like hand sculpted, which is something we did not do with other world spaces because it's much faster to do it automatically. But I think I think it managed to come out surprisingly good. And that that is really awesome and i'm really looking forward to seeing what you come up with please do keep us updated on that what's the best way to follow with the, the work that you guys are doing we are active on a number of social media websites you can follow us on twitter at fallout vault 13 and then you can find us on instagram fallout 4 vault 13 we have a youtube channel fallout vault 13 and we have a discord server but we aren't big enough so we don't have a custom link so if you go to our Twitter account, Fallout Vault 13, in our bio or description, you can find a link to our Discord server. And that's where we post everything update-wise, you know, showcase videos, music, everything goes there first. So be sure to join our Discord if you want to see that before anyone else does. 
Yeah, it's like we regularly keep posting like some small like pictures of what we're working on on the the public server. So if you want to see like sneak peeks of little locations, you can keep track of it there. Great. Well, I definitely know I will. This was Giblib and Colin Wino from Fallout Vault 13. Thanks very much for joining us there. Oh, thank you for having us. Hello everyone and welcome to the Fallout Creature Feature, where we take a look at some of the most notable animals, monsters, and strange beings that inhabit the wasteland. I'm LS, and today I'd like you to take a journey with me. You're a fresh courier in New Vegas, and you haven't played the game before. Instead of heading south of Good Springs, you decide to head north. You encounter a couple of random animals, some bloatflies, maybe a rad scorpion, nothing too sinister. You keep walking, and suddenly, you come across a number of small, blue masses floating erratically in the air. You think, ah, nothing more than another pack of insect creatures, let's take care of this quickly. You open fire with the weapons you got from town, but there's hardly any effect on these creatures. You fire again, rapidly now, but still do minimal damage. All the while, the insects mount their charge against you, stinging you with their venom. You feel woozy. Next thing you know, you're back in Good Springs, having to redo all of the progress you just made because you didn't save often enough. And that, my friends, is your first encounter with the Cazador. The Cazador comes off as an even frailer-looking bloatfly at first, but don't let that weak-looking exterior fool you. These monstrous pests are one of the biggest dangers the Mojave Wasteland has to offer. What's interesting about the Cazador is that it's a man-made, well, brain-made invention. They originally come from the Big Empty, the result of the mad science of Dr. Boris, a member of the Think Tank. Large groups of them eventually escaped from the DNA splicing lab in Big Mountain, and have since infested the Mojave Wasteland and Zion Canyon. Boris, of course, denies that this has happened, although we all know how little the think tank actually know about the outside world. Their biggest rivals for territory in the Big Empty are the Night Stalkers, another creation of Boris's gone horribly, horribly wrong. If you encounter these bugs on your travels throughout the Mojave, be careful. They attack in swarms, and a single sting from them can do more physical damage than a sting from a giant rad scorpion and give you three times the poison damage. If you have to face them at some point, make sure that you're well-stocked on ammo and healing supplies before heading into the fray. All in all, the Cazador is one of the deadliest creatures in the Fallout universe. Not only that, the Cazador, like so many other creatures that are found in the world of Fallout, serve as a grim reminder of what can happen if mad science and ambition are left unchecked. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Fallout Creature Feature. For Junk Radio, I'm L.S. Have you thought about making Fallout content? Come and give it a try. Chunk Radio is an open access podcast and that means you can be a part of it. Maybe you want to talk about some of the places and people in Fallout or maybe you have an idea for an audio drama. If you have a face radio, please get in touch on Twitter at Nukipedia, on our Discord, through the wiki at fallout.fandom.com or via our email at nukafalloutwiki at gmail.com. Joining us this week on Public Occurrences... The Wasteland Theatre Company. So I'm joined here by Northern Harvest, who is part of the Wasteland Theatre Company. And they have been running some shows very much like Shakespeare in the Park through Fallout 76. How are you doing there, Northern Harvest? Good. Thank you for having me today. No problem at all. Let's start with an easy one. What was your first Fallout moment? How did you get into the series? So... I'm very, very new to the Fallout series. I only started playing Fallout just over a year ago. We started with a couple of workmates who wanted to play together, um, you know, a multiplayer game when we're done work. And they eventually moved on. But I was just, I was captivated by a a world full of stories and of the, the human struggle, the fallen root, like the ruins and the fallen buildings, and something really just struck me about, you know, the mortality of it all, of the the stories of every, sorry to be more, but the stories of every corpse lying on, on, 
on the road or in the corners. I soaked it all in and, and imagined these folks went through in their last moments, which are so beautifully displayed by the game, let alone the little notes and the hollow tapes that all had stories to them. And, and that was incredibly touching in a, in a, you know, in a funny way, so especially as a new Fallout player. I basically just started, you know, during the, the global pandemic. So there are a lot of connections between the idea of an, an apocalypse, so to speak, or of, of some major world-changing event. And then looking at these folks and all the stories and struggles they went through, that was kind of my first fallout moment that really, that really kept me playing, just seeing these people and imagining the stories. That's really interesting to hear that uh, new into the series. Have you gone into looking at any of the classic games or have you just kept a Fallout 76? You know, I've, I've been playing 76 and it's now consumed a lot of my time putting on full Shakespeare plays in it. But I did uh, recently, and this isn't classic, but I did recently just finish my first playthrough of Fallout 4 and I just uh, started Fallout 3. I, I started Fallout New Vegas first because a bunch of people were saying how wonderful it was, but I didn't really... It didn't really, the opening few moments didn't work for me. So I went to Fallout 3 first, which the opening moments did work for me. And I'm sure I'll go back to New Vegas because, you know, I have to give it a, a good chance and I hear good things about it. I haven't done one or one or two. When I think back to high school, it strikes me that there were two type of kids. And I think this even goes in into adults. That there's those who get Shakespeare and those who don't. What was the moment or passage that really made Shakespeare connect with you? So this is... This is surprising to most people, but I was not a Shakespeare person. I didn't like Shakespeare, and I even took 17th century literature in, in university, and I avoided Shakespeare as hard as I possibly could, you know, opting for, like, Paradise Lost, like Milton and John Doane and and those types of, of poets I was more drawn to than Shakespeare. I felt that a young person, Shakespeare, I didn't connect to it. I was more interested in, in punk music and all of that. What really brought me back to Shakespeare, I kind of say I've been rediscovering Shakespeare as an adult. I'm now in my 30s. I have two little kids. It was actually Fallout that brought me back to Shakespeare because, especially Fallout 7-6, and I built a theater because I saw somebody else had made a, a movie theater, this fellow from the UK called Lemus. He built a movie theater. So I built a, like a physical theater just for fun and started posing mannequins in different costumes according to different pop culture movies and plays and and i had one you know set up for macbeth it was pretty neat and people were coming by and checking it out and and eventually talked with some some role players the fallout 50 new responders it's a role play group that role plays responders in fallout 76 and we discussed putting on an actual live play of Macbeth. And that's really what brought me back to Shakespeare, because you take the Macbeth script and looking at it again, which I haven't looked at since since high school, right? I just fell in love with it right away. The writing, finally, it made sense. The stories and the characters and the themes, everything that the high school teacher talked about. You remember high school teachers, the theme, the theme, the theme, and all of that started falling into place. And I was revering this script and laughing at the funny parts and really following along with the intense parts. So it was really Fallout, funny enough, that helped me rediscover Shakespeare for the first time in probably 20 years. And that's what our productions are doing for a lot of people right now, which is what is drawing so many Fallout fans to what we're doing is because people like Shakespeare. You know, some people don't. Even those who are playing Fallout who, like me, didn't look at Shakespeare again, are being drawn back to it. They see the fun in Shakespeare and the creativity and the ability to play with other people in something that's as, as classic and well-known as the Bard. That's really interesting. I'm surprised it was the fallout that got you into it and, yeah. and, and, and hearing the link through there, Macbeth. Would, would you say it's Macbeth that fits in best with the War, War Never Changes theme? Or, or would you think another play? No, like... <laughs> So since we did our first live performance of Macbeth last winter, and since then we've held a Shakespearean sonnet festival in February, and then we did a live full performance of Romeo and Juliet in the spring. I've been going through Shakespeare. I've got a complete works of Shakespeare book, which has all of Shakespeare's plays, because I'm really into it. I'm all in Shakespeare these days. And if there's one play that I think matches the best the, with Fallout, it's actually Coriolanus. It's it's not one that is people play on stage as often as the Macbeth and Hamlet, and Romeo and Juliet, those ones. But Coriolanus really stood out to me as the war never changes theme. If you imagine, and this is what I do when I'm reading a, a Shakespeare play, 
because it always has my fallout lens on, I think about what factions and what people are involved in the play. So when we did Macbeth, we did it organically and, and properly. It was set in Scotland and all of that. But when we did Romeo and Juliet... We changed things up a little bit, having Montagues and Capulets, the two warring households. And we changed that to the two factions in Fallout, the settlers and the raiders. And there's two lovers from each of those factions who who meet. And then the romance and tragedy unfolds between those two factions. But Coriolanus, which takes place in Roman Empire, and this this general who's very arrogant and full of pride and uh, is an amazing general, and he's fighting the... The Volskins with Alphidius, who are like sort of like a rebel group. And I just imagined the Romans as the Brotherhood of Steel, Volscians as raiders, and these two groups fighting each other, and Coriolanus eventually walking over to them and seeking his glory by joining their side and ultimately coming back. And you know, the, there's a whole tragedy involved. But but that one I think has two two warring groups that really fit the sort of Brotherhood of Steel and Raiders image in my mind. And there's actually a movie with Ralph Fiennes, Lord Voldemort, played Coriolanus. And Gerald Butler actually was playing the other side. I don't think it got a lot of rave reviews as modern adaptations of Shakespeare don't necessarily, but I thought it was great when I had my Fallout lens on. So I encourage anybody to watch that movie. If you're a Fallout player and you want to figure out what I'm talking about, watch that movie and just imagine the Brotherhood of Steel and the Raiders and you'll get it. It'll click. I, I will definitely be doing that. <laughs> a lot of lore and other information within Fallout 76, a lot of the storytelling and world building, is done very much in a passive way, coming back from its roots back when it didn't have NPCs in it. As you've played through, has there been any stories that you've come across where you've just thought of, geez, I wish there was a play of this or a movie of this or something like that? And I liked the story in Fallout 7, 6 of the, the Mistress of Mystery. They were going someplace with that and as a, you know, as a quest line and there was a story and there were lots of different characters. So I think that the segment would actually make a pretty good <laughs> movie or, or play or story. The Mistress of Mysteries is actually something that I wish there was more, more story to because I was already captivated by it. I couldn't agree more. That's, that's actually my favorite quest line out of any Fallout game. Yeah, and then it, and then it ends. Uh, unfortunately, it's a tragedy you see coming because of the way Fallout 76 was originally built. But yeah, it's... right. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm blessed and and, and lucky that I started playing well, well after all of the the launch chaos that I don't know anything about. <laughs> so I started playing at a really good time where I could just I played it and enjoyed it from beginning to now. So as we record this, you do have the Shakespeare Sonnet Festival going on again, but that of course will be over by the time that we do play out this record. This recording. <laughs> what more can we look forward to though in the next few weeks and months from the company? Today is Sunday, the September fourth. <laughs> is our second Shakespeare Sonnet Festival. I'll, I'll just talk a second about it because we did something really unique this time. Um, so we have about 20 sonnet readers from across the Fallout 7-6 community who will be taking part. And it's going to be across every system. You know, so Fallout 7-6, it's not across systems. You play on Xbox, you can only play with Xbox people. Um, but our Sonnet Festival will be on PlayStation, PC, and Xbox. We have a stage on each system built by a player, and then the players from within that system who registered will be reading their sonnets on that stage, and it'll all be broadcast on Twitch so that people who are in the PlayStation stage can also watch the Xbox people and can also watch the PC people, and all happening at the same time. So we're actually, we found a way to actually play together with people on other systems even though the way it's set up that's possible um and on top of that we saw that and this is uh we used a lot of the fallout wiki for this is that we asked every participant to pick their favorite vault or to go through the wiki that shows all of the numbered vaults and to go through that list and find a vault that has a story based on the wiki, unless you uh, know it yourself, find a vault that has an interesting story that means something to you. Pick your favorite vault. Let's say someone picks vault 76. There's 154 Shakespeare sonnets. So they pick vault 76 and they're assigned sonnet 76. They pick vault 111, they're assigned sonnet 111 and so forth. Vault. They then are going to be reading the sonnet from a perspective of their vault dweller from that vault with the experiences that they're experiencing with the with the sick experiments going on in there, or a scientist from that vault, from Vault Tech, 
they're trying to find meaning within the sonnet that applies to their experiences in the vault. So for example, spoiler, I'm doing sonnet 19 corresponding with vault 19. And in vault 19, the vault tech experiment was to induce paranoia amongst the, the vault dwellers there without using violence or, or chems, right? To actually use like psychological experiments on these people to make them go crazy and suspect each other and, and create that kind of environment. The sonnet 19, the corresponding sonnet, is all about time and age and how he's actually having a war with time in that in that sonnet, which makes me think of a, a vault dweller in Vault 19 you know, locked in a room with a ticking clock going crazy and just yelling at time that's devouring him. And sonnet 19 starts with devouring time is the first line, right? Like he's, he's exclaiming it to this ticking clock in his confined little room in the vault. So that's just an example of how Shakespeare's sonnets and the readers who are reading from the perspective of dwellers in those vaults, how those things can kind of blend together. And it's going to be really quite interesting. Um, um, I wasn't expecting anything quite like that. We do have something planned for folks who aren't going to be at the Sonnet Festival in sort of mid-October. We're in rehearsals right now. We're doing a full performance of A Midsummer Night's Dream, which is going to be an exciting one because it has so much. It's a, it's a comedy. We've only done tragedies so far, which kind of fit the Fallout world. We have a little twist in there that, that folks can look forward to. And we're really playing with the stage and the lighting and the, the natural environment. It's an open-air stage that we've built, the natural environment of a region called the Meyer in Fallout 7-6, which has a lot of really neat mist and mysterious environmental setting. So that's coming up in mid-October. You can follow us at 7-6 Theatre on Twitter for all of our promotions that we'll be doing leading up to that show. And is that the best way to get in touch if you want to get involved as well? Yeah, Twitter's, Twitter's the best way. It's at 7-6 Theatre with R-E, not E-R, Theatre. And that's the best way to keep up with what we're doing. We also do lots of other fun things. We do like little photo shoot of scenes from movies just for fun, you know, in our downtime and get distracted by radiation rumble and events like that all the time. And, and you mentioned Twitch. Do you keep recordings of these open on Twitch? As mentioned, we do have a group called the Fallout 5 Responders, a role-playing group. They uh, often are our producers for live streaming on Twitch. They also have our previous shows on, on their YouTube. So Fallout 5 search them on YouTube, and you'll see some of our productions there along with some of their amazing responder roleplay videos and machinima that they do full-length movies in Fallout 7-6. And our Sonnet Festival is going to be broadcast on the United Wastelanders Network, Twitch. So you can check those folks out as well. Well, I think I've just found something to do this weekend. Thanks very much for joining us there, Nolan Harvest. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Thank you for joining this broadcast of Junk Radio, the pipcast from Nukipedia, the Fallout Wiki. This episode of Junk Radio is produced by contributors on both sides of the Atlantic, and in respect for events that occurred during the production of this episode, we're closing with a tune that unites both sides of the Atlantic. Although we may call it different things and even sing different words, there is more that unites us than divides us. God bless America, and God save the King. And as always, please remember to turn off your Pip-Boy.